This next panel is called Putting Bitcoin to Work. They've been talking backstage about all kinds of interesting things they're going to cover. Kaylin Medvedev, co-founder and managing partner at Nexo. Another uh, true OG, Peter Smith, co-founder and CEO of the company with the best name in the industry, blockchain.com. Jason Urban, co-head of trading at Galaxy. James Putra, VP and head of product strategy at Trade Station Crypto. And moderating the panel is going to be Coin Matir, founder of UTXO Management. Give it up. There we go. It's the best intro music I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I thought you were going to come out dancing. <laughs> All right, well, we've got, uh, uh, we've got 30 minutes with you guys. We've uh, I've broken down this panel into a couple different topics on putting your Bitcoin to work, uh, including interest accounts, borrowing against your Bitcoin. We're going to talk a little bit about DeFi and then, and then derivatives. We'll start uh, each panelist, quick introduction of yourself, and talk about what product offerings you, you offer to put your Bitcoin to work. OK. Uh, James Pucha, TradeStation Crypto. We have a uh, retail brokerage firm that offers spot trading. We also do interest-bearing accounts. Uh, we also do on the institutional side, we'll do borrow, lend, and uh, a variety of other things with the securities broker dealer. That's our sister company. Uh, Jason Urban, Galaxy Digital. We are primarily institutional and high net worth focused. We offer lending, derivatives, trading, both electronically and block trading, you know, across over 90 pairs right now. <clears throat> My name is Peter Smith. I'm the CEO and co founder of blockchain.com. Across our retail and institutional business, we account for about a third of all on-chain network transactions on the Bitcoin network. In our lending and institutional business, we're primarily focused on structured credit as well as trading. And within that, we run about, you know, on any given month, about a $2 billion, $3 billion volume loan book monthly. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Kalim Metodiev. I'm a co-founder and managing partner at uh, Nexo. We uh, offer a retail-oriented, uh, all-around uh, platform that's mostly known for uh, cryptocurrency back lending, but we also offer um, uh, interest uh, uh, earning accounts. Uh, increasingly more, we are doing, uh, we're offering trading. Our trading is becoming uh, actually an increasingly larger part of our operations. We offer uh, derivatives, and uh, we're progressing towards uh, uh, custody and, uh, and banking services to complete a 360 degree financial service. Great. Let's, uh, let's dig into uh, these, these interest accounts that I've been seeing pop up everywhere. 6% on your Bitcoin, 12% on, mm -hmm. on, on US dollars, 100% uh, on, on every other token out there. Uh, but <laughs> what's happening in the background? How, how is that possible? Sure. So I'll start. So we have a um, we do, we operate a lend and borrow desk on our side. So what we do is we're able to take assets like uh, USDC or dollars or Ethereum, lend it out. We'll take that back in over collateralized. We're going to get the, an interest rate for doing that. Um, I think it's probably interesting to talk about why that market exists. You've got a lot of folks that have Bitcoin and they don't have access to banks or you have a lot of institutions that are trying to generate yield on the assets. So they will come to someone like TradeStation and borrow assets from us. Um, so a lot of what we do is we run a lend and borrow desk that does subsidize the interest rates that we pay to the customers. Yeah. And Colin, the same, the same sort of setup for something like Nexo that's more retail client focused? It is. I mean, um, you know, for a lot of institutions, you know, paying these high yields, as you pointed out, it's a, it's a challenge, you know, because once you source the liquidity, what do you do with it? And, uh, you know, for us, it, it really is a very simple strategy. We lend. Uh, to nearly 2 million global retail users, you know, so we con continuously have more demand uh, for coins and, you know, fiat stable coins than, uh, you know, even what, uh, you know, we can source from the market. Back-to-back -back lending, boring banking business. So a lot of these accounts that, that I've looked at, I, I, uh, uh, I look at everything in Bitcoin. I, I don't have any money parked in the interest-bearing accounts because uh, uh, rates typically come with, with risk. Are there any risks involved with, with these sorts of accounts and what type of questions or due diligence should individuals or institutions be asking before onboarding into these uh, on-ramps? Yeah, you know, that's a, a tough one. And if we could just turn the volume up slightly so I can hear the moderator, that'd be awesome. But um, 
one of the things that I think you should look for as a consumer when you're evaluating these accounts is you should really only be parking your capital in companies that have strong governance. So look and see, is there a real board of directors? And deep equity balance sheets. So you know, in our case, we have a, you know, a core equity balance sheet that we measure in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and one on the company is extremely profitable. It's probably safer to put your money there where there's a reserve buffer than it is to place your capital in a company where you don't know what the capital buffer is, where there is improper governance. And so in general, I'd be very concerned about parking my capital with a startup. And it kind of pains me to say that as someone who built you know, one of the first Bitcoin startups. But an interest-bearing product is probably not, whereas a retail customer or even an institutional or high net worth, you want to park your assets to generate yield. Yeah, I, think, I think the most important thing that if anybody takes anything from today, it's not return on capital, it's return of capital. And, and you know, the, far and away the most important thing. And so, you know, you're exactly right. You have to look at balance sheet. You have to look at what are the regulatory stops that are put in place. I mean, we are, you know, as one of the largest publicly traded companies in the space, it, it can be an impediment, but it's also a great advantage. And so it does give our clients a sense of security, knowing that there's a very visible set of balance sheets, there's a very, you know, visible governance, and that we are regulated six ways from Sunday. So yeah, it's super important to know what's going on with the assets. If you're going to make a deposit or you're going to put, a, put your assets into an interest-bearing account, is that company going to rehypothecate the assets? What are they doing with the collateral? Can I get it back? As Jason points out, those are really important. So what are you doing with my assets? How are you paying the interest rate? How do I know I'm going to get it back? Those are the questions I'd be looking at. Don't and, lose and, Bitcoin. That's always been Bitcoin, the one maybe, goal. Maybe just one last thing, you know, just to add to what Peter was saying earlier. Um, because we have these internal discussions you know, on the topic all the time, and then we talk to clients. You know, they ask us you know, how we're different from the competition. And, it just one recurring thing, you know, that coming that, that comes up, you know, to me is I remember, you know, back in the days in, in college, you know, they were teaching us, you know, what are the five C's of credit, you know, and uh, uh, you know the the first couple of things we're, you're looking at is character and capacity, you know, and these days it seems in our space, you know, people are just coming, you know, to these platforms and they're asking about the fifth thing, you know, which is conditions, you know, so, you know, what is the interest rate you're paying? Twelve percent, great. Here's my money. What about homework? What about the risks? You know, and uh, this is what we keep telling people: do your homework. You know, look at first. You know, the character. You need to know who you're giving your money to, and you know, you need to know if they have the capacity. You know, to pay this interest. You know, and if it's too good to be true, stay away from it. You know, this is this is my recommendation to everybody. Another market that's been growing exponentially is uh, taking loans against your Bitcoin. Does anybody want to try to simplistically explain? How that how that works and how that market's uh, developed to today. It's it's an asset backed loan, and so no different than taking a home equity line against your home. It's using an asset that has value and unlocking that asset's value in a way that you know might work. Unfortunately, as we all would like Bitcoin to be taken by the electric company or the bank, that's not happening right now. And so you need to basically do currency swaps. And that's effectively what you're doing when you're taking a loan in fiat against your, your digital assets, because it allows you to get something that you need. And that market has evolved you know, dramatically. There's everything from margin loans, where clients will come in and say, if the, the asset appreciates or depreciates in value, we reset them. We have a collar loan pro program where clients can put a derivative on it and basically set the interest rate at zero. And, deal with let the options do the work there's just a variety of ways it's everything that's very similar to what we know in the traditional world it, it's super important on this one though because most of the time you're going to have over collateralized if you want to borrow ten dollars we're going to ask for 15 to 20 dollars in bitcoin so you need to make sure if you're going to do this you ask the company what are you going to do with my bitcoin are you going to rehypothecate my collateral and lend it out again and now we have cascading leverage or are you going to put it in cold storage? How do I know my collateral is safe and I can get my Bitcoin back when I return the loan? So there's kind of a theme, a theme forming here of, of understanding you're parking your Bitcoin somewhere. What is that person doing with the, with the collateral? What are, what are the risks? That market was, I think it was at zero a couple of years ago. I couldn't imagine getting a loan against my Bitcoin. How, how big is it today? Does anybody have any it's, idea? It's growing exponentially, at least from our perspective. Uh, 
we had something like five billion uh, dollars worth, you know, in, in in assets at the beginning of this year, and right now, we're, you know, or you know, let's say a month ago, you know, last time I looked, you know, we were over twenty billion. I mean, it's growing exponentially, you know, and. Uh, uh, I, I, for, for customers, it's not only about yield and, and, and return. It's also about simplicity. You know, on our platform, you just you know you store your assets. You immediately start earning an interest. If you want to borrow against it, you can. You know, at any, at, at any time, it's fully automated. If you want to uh, you know make payments, we have a card. You know that we have made available to people. You know, so they can you know use the credit line. You know, for making uh, for making purchases uh, with it. But once again, you know, there is, I mean, it looks simple enough, but it's something that we discussed, you know, backstage before we started this panel is there is a, you know, a huge organization and policies and procedures behind it, you know, KYC, AML, we do things in a compliant way and, you know, all these guys here on stage, you know, they're institutional uh, service providers, you know, so we, we play by the book and it's very important for customers to know more about it, learn it and understand how their service providers work. Great. Speaking of KYC and loans, there's been a lot of, of, uh, of activity going on uh, on chain versus with a, with a centralized party that you're that you're dealing with. Uh, I know that Jason had some commentary before the panel with uh, with OFAC and the, the potential risks involved for an individual uh, going into these sort of products. Yeah, I, I think that you have to understand what the what the risk is that you're taking. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Yield comes at a cost. And so some of the things that we, as I mentioned at the onset, you know, as one of the largest publicly traded companies, we have to be, that's a huge advantage, but it's also a disadvantage because it's very easy for a regulator to come and attack us, you know, or inquire as to our activities. And so when we think about things like DeFi, while the yields are very attractive and the innovation in the space is phenomenal, there also comes with that thought of what is, what is the AML KYC attached to it and how do you navigate that and be thoughtful around it so that you aren't you know, doing something against the law or doing something that ultimately comes back to bite you in the end. When people are taking out these loans, what are they using the capital for? What are you guys seeing out there? What's the demand for? I think that you know, what folks often say is that it's being used for like cash flow management. I think it's probably predominantly for leverage. When you do the on-chain analytics to look at where capital is flowing, it's often borrowing coin and then recycling it back into the ecosystem. Um, and we see that across both our own retail business as well as across our institutional clients where we're a large net lender with pretty much everyone on stage. And so I think the predominant usage right now is less cash flow management and more leverage. I think over time you, you probably see more cash flow management use, but probably less through asset-backed loans and more through structured products particularly at like a high net worth or institutional level, a lot of what our clients are doing now is buying structured product from us, you know, whether it's an offtake, an option, um, that allows them to generate cash without moving out of the position, but is, is less an asset-backed loan. I think a lot of the asset-backed loans today are primarily about generating additional capital for further leverage. I think we see, we tend to deal, we don't deal with the retail on the lend side, we deal with the other interest rate or other lenders, so we'll do wholesale loans. What they tend to do with it is going to be uh, to be able to fuel their lending business, to be able to fuel their interest rate business, possibly for trading strategies. We're starting to see now a lot of folks wanting to borrow against their grayscale, share, grayscale shares to be able to increase a little bit of leverage or also fuel their business. And so you're staking your Bitcoin as collateral. You're getting the, the USD or the Bitcoin, whatever, whatever you're taking out as the, as the asset. Uh, what happens if that collateral goes down in price? So if we, if the, if we had a, a massive price shock to the Bitcoin system, what would the, the situation look like for, for the borrower? You're probably well, going to get I mean, a phone call from all of us. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is unfortunately something that happens on a regular basis. It just happened you know, last week, last couple of weeks. And you know, this is, this, these are the times you know, that you know, we keep telling our clients, for example, that when we require the LTVs on their loans to be at acceptable levels and you know, for our clients to please borrow responsibly, uh, you know, these are the times, unfortunately, when, I mean, we're not in a position you know, to, to, to say, you know, we told you so because this is not what we do, you know, this is not why we're in business, you know, but it, it's, important, you know, it's important to uh, utilize uh, leverage uh, 
responsibly uh, yeah, because you know when if, when, if and when the uh, you know the, the market crashes even if it is temporarily uh, you know our system for example it's fully automated uh, you know no human capital involvement whatsoever it issues automatically margin calls and if the borrowers don't take any action if they don't repay part of their loans if they, if they don't add collateral unfortunately you know we're facing some liquidations you know and that's that's how we protect our business and how we run uh, risk management uh, uh, effectively. It's not new. I mean, people borrow against assets in all different, different walks of life here. We, probably every one of us up here, have systems that are running 24 hours a day, monitoring the value of the collateral, making margin calls, doing collateral releases. It, it's becoming really sophisticated and uh, something that's really a pleasure to work with now. So we've, uh, uh, we recently had a shock in, in, in Bitcoin's price, and uh, I don't have the view and the insight that you guys have into this, into this world. So you can see all the liquidations that happened on people that were, uh, had open interest on derivatives platform. What did that look like? Uh, were there a lot of margin calls or like forced sales in the market that, that ended up affecting the price? I mean, there were definitely margin calls that affected the price, and, you, and you've seen it as the market has moved. You can look at the richness of the basis trade and using that as kind of a metric to be able to see how much leverage is in the system and how fragile the system is at any given point, right? It, it's any market in the world, whether it's oil, whether it's soybeans, whether it's stocks, the same, the same things apply in our market. And so you can kind of watch some of those metrics to get a sense of when markets are overbought, oversold, and what does that look like versus a steady state. I think that's super important because the basis trade really gave us a foreshadowing of what was happening. We saw late April this starting to unwind on the basis trade, which then you watch the derivatives market, the option strategies come in, and you can really see that the market's over leveraged and the bids are not there and people are starting to pull out of the market. Does anyone want to take a high level stab on what the basis trade is for the audience? So, so effectively the basis trade is you are long an asset, in this case Bitcoin, and you can sell a future on an exchange that will be deliverable at some point, say 30, 60, 90 days out. Now, generally speaking, based on the term structure, that future will have a higher value, and so you effectively take your long spot position and you've hedged it with a short futures position with the hope of having that spread compress and effect effectively become zero at the end, and that's a rate of return that you will get on your asset. And so that's one of the funding mechanisms that some lenders use. There are a variety of ways. Also, hedge funds use it to trade. It's very popular in all markets, um, but it was particularly pronounced in ours most recently. And you saw a lot of a lot of hot money coming in and chasing it, as well as you know, professionals who've been doing it for a long time. I think one of the things to add to like the contagion frame in uh, leveraging crypto is that a lot of what you see is, you know. Uh, a volatile moment kick off in the futures or perpetuals that comes down to then the margin market so like exchanges that offer margin the market really starts moving and you start to have like market failures and matching engines that means that people can't liquidate and so you start liquidating further and further back in the book then you start seeing people run out of liquidity to do liquidations around the market and it starts to get really disorderly and we've seen a few of those moves in the last six months um, those are quite concerning because it tells you that there's a fair amount of phantom leverage in the system where people are borrowing against collateral and then executing quite hard on the way down. It's made worse by the matching engine failures that are prevalent in our space. Um, and so when those matching engines fail or you, know, you have liquidation engine failures, it starts to get very disorderly. And that's one reason that you know, my advice to folks when they're using leverage in crypto is to be extremely conservative. Because you know, the market fundamentals, if one of these sort of uh, market failures occurs, do not matter. It is just you know, going until they get the engines back up. Well, and maybe just one other you know, word of caution you know, when it comes to basis trading. You know, it's, it's obviously you know, all a matter of supply and demand. You know, uh, let's say if I'm doing a basis trade you know, and I'm selling the future, you know, as Jason explained, Know, there's some, but some other market participant is, you know, is, is obviously long that, you know, that, that future trade. And we remember uh, what it was probably a, a month ago. You know, the, you know, the premium on uh, the December, you know, 2021 future was 30% on an annualized basis. You know, so 
there was somebody, you know, who's buying that trade, you know, and obviously, you know, when the market went through the spiral of de-risking and deleveraging, you know, a lot of these people, you know, being long the future, they got decimated, you know, so that's yet another thing, you know, so yes, you know, you know, the, the person or the institution, you know, the trader that's doing the basis trade, you know, they're, you know, market neutral, but, uh, you know, those, you know, that were supplying the liquidity, you know, they obviously, uh, you know, they, they paid the price, you know, so yet, Another thing that we keep telling our clients is, you know, when, when things look too good, too good to be true, you know, just, you know, stop for a moment, you know, think twice before you do something, you know, and don't, you know, extend yourself too much, you know, because then, you know, obviously there's nothing we can do to help. So a big trade that we saw in the last year was the, the GBTC trade, parking your Bitcoin in GBTC, holding on to it for a year, selling it at a premium. That's now trading at a, is it? 15, 20% discount. Do you guys have any thoughts or theories around how that plays out over the next 12 months? It's For those that are holders? It's all, it's all driven by the ETF, right? And, and so the minute that we get jurisdictional uh, clarity on the ETF in the United States, you know, the thought is, is that that would naturally flow to there and you would see that premium, you know, revert to, or that discount rather revert to normal. Um, but it's an open-ended trade, and you don't know when that's going to happen, right? It's, it's, it, it, it's regulatory arbitrage. That's the game you're playing, and if you're comfortable with that, you know, there's, there's a 15% there's a yield out there for you. I think we are generally hesitant to engage in regulatory arbit arbitrating uh, because we don't have a crystal regulatory ball. Uh, if I did, I would be in another line of business. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, don't, don't love that trading strategy. Um, and we require very high collateral for folks who um, are on that trading strategy that we lend to on the institutional side. Mm -hmm. I would say that this panel has been a little bit of doom and gloom. It has. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, guys. You might be wondering, why do you guys run a lending business if it's uh. so variable? And what I will say on that is it is possible to run these businesses in a very responsible manner to generate real revenue and to do so while managing client risk. In the case of our business, our institutional lending business, and, and we don't lend to retail, um, has you know, never suffered a major liquidation, has never suffered a lost month. Um, but we're also very conservative. We run at a very high collateral level, um, and we run you know, positions with a very select few number of counterparties that we have a very high level of comfort and have done a very deep you know, due diligence process on. Um, and so we're very, we're sort of like, you know, for being uh, young, you know, the crypto guys, we're like very, uh, we're like very old school in terms of how much risk we're willing to take. But it is very possible, and everyone on stage runs a successful lending business, it is possible to run a successful, well-run lending business in crypto and generate yield for your clients. We generate, you know, tens of millions of dollars in yield for our clients every month. And so it's possible to do it, but it is tough, and it requires a lot of very diligent risk management. Yeah, so I think since if we've been too doom and gloom, the next two minutes I want to spend, what has you guys excited? What kind of products, um, what kind of opportunities are, are, are available that gets you guys excited uh, about the future ahead? I'm super excited about all the different trading strategies that are starting to come out. Uh, a lot of, like, we're probably engaged in these higher end institutional strategies but I'm starting to see a lot more of the retail audience get involved and be able to take advantage of them in a safe way. That's really interesting to watch what customers can do. I, th I think the, move, the movement to more traditional, you know, derivative strategies, we talked a little bit about basis, but there's so many other things that are out there and that are now available. Uh, they're available to institutional clients, but that ultimately bleeds down to the entire ecosystem. And I think we're only going to get more and more of that. Um, and it's going to make, the assets that we all have and own more valuable to us and more useful in our portfolios. I think at blockchain.com, the Goldman Alumni Club is extremely excited about derivatives. They're with you. Uh, and then the crypto kids like me are super pumped about DeFi. I'm really interested in the way that you can disintermediate um, you know, sort of the principle in the lending arrangement. And we're not from our lending business side, but from another side of the company very involved in the DeFi markets, um, and in particular in, in lending and LPing, uh, which I'm spending a, a huge amount of time on right now. Well, 
for us, uh, we keep talking about it on a daily basis. You know, what we're very excited about is that we had the chance, you know, to set up a company that provides a global service. Uh, I mentioned already, you know, we're servicing, you know, close to 2 million customers around the world. And, you know, this isn't something that we dreamt of when we started the company. We we're saying, hey, you know, if we, you know, maybe one day in the future we'll reach 1 million customers and it only took us a couple of years to reach 2 million. So uh, we're excited about the future opportunities. You know, what, you know what, what we would like to do is not really, I mean, you know, p part of our actually slogan is, you know, that we're redefining finance, you know, but we're still providing financial services, borrowing, lending, trading, margin, derivatives. You know, we're not inventing something new, but we're, what we try to do on a daily basis is through fintech, through smart management of, uh, you know, policies and, uh, and uh, customer service, to uh, you know, in, in, invigorate you know, in, invigorate finance and you know, invigorate customers, allow them to work with us on a new and seamless uh, basis, so that they feel comfortable uh, obtaining their services through through uh, one platform. And you know, for us, you know, the the, the long term uh, uh, result is you know to basically uh, you know reach out customers that are using their services, you know, for example, you know, they're using some services at a bank, other services at a broker dealer. We want to be the one stop shop for the provision of all these services in the future. Real quick, final piece of advice for people that are newer to the space. Read up and just get started somewhere. Just take a little bite. Ask questions. Don't be afraid. There's no dumb question in crypto. Uh, we all were newbies at one point. Um, and so from that standpoint, ask questions, find trusted sources, triangulate to get the right information, and you'll definitely end up, we're all, we're all here to help, even everybody on this panel here. We're competitors, we're friends, a rising tide lips all boats. We're here to help. Ask anybody a question. I'll give you my number one most successful trading strategy in crypto in the last nine years, which is to just log into an account every month on the same day and buy some crypto, one of the top four cryptos. <laughs> Just keep doing that every month for eight years, and I guarantee you, you'll re you won't regret it. And then, ca call well, just uh, 15 seconds, and then we're going to wrap up. Well, I mean, just, just very sim simply, tread carefully. You know, don't try to become a millionaire overnight. It's possible, but don't try to do it. Uh, do your homework, ask questions, know who you're doing business with, uh, and uh, think about return of capital and uh, risk management. All right, thank you everybody. Appreciate it guys, thank you.